I started no-tilling 40 years ago, and I had no idea what soil health was. I did it because it was more economically feasible. 25 years ago, my son was at Penn State University and worked for a big farmer close to Penn State, and he cover cropped everything right behind the salvage chopper. So I went home and started cover cropping everything behind the salvage chopper, and I didn't really know why other than he did it, and if he did it, it must be right. It wasn't until about 10 years ago that I realized that the no-till and the cover crop really would grow into a soil health benefit to me. I have been doing no-till since 1982, and then since the mid-90s, really focusing in on adding cover crops to my cropping system. 100% no-till, 100% cover crops on about 300 acres. Our primary crops that take up the most time is three acres of high tunnel heirloom tomatoes, and about 60 acres of squash, 20 acres of pumpkins, and then I have some corn and soybeans and uh, a bunch of small grains as well. And I'm also growing some cover crop seed to sell that to other farmers. I've been doing no-till for uh, a little over 30 years. And I started no-tilling because it's good for the soil and it's, it's a lot quicker. There's less steps involved. You don't have to till the soil. You don't have to plow it. And the added benefit is that it's environmentally friendly. Well, I've, I don't know anything different in my lifetime, but my uncle has been doing cover crops, and especially no-till anyway, since the mid-70s. So if someone asked me to go out there and, and work some ground or the, the plow a field or do something like that, I wouldn't. I could do it, but I wouldn't be the most efficient or it wouldn't look real pretty when I got done because I didn't grow up doing that. You could argue that plowing has been done for millennia, uh, but it wasn't very aggressive up till then. When, when John Deere invented that plow to turn the soil over, that made it so much easier to plant and it was able to break up the prairies in the Midwest so they could actually plant into that. And, and that was the reason why it became so popular so quickly. And we all heard what the damage was that was really come to light during the Dust Bowl. There was a fellow wrote a book called The Plowman's Folly. And this was written in 1941. And Edward Faulkner talked about particle separation. And this was shortly after the Dust Bowl, so it was probably fresh in his mind. If we continue tilling our soil with our heavy equipment, we will create runoff that's gonna pollute our rivers and streams to the point the cost of cleaning up will be astronomical. 41, he predicted all this. The first thing I'm gonna try, we're just gonna take some soil from long time no-till and some soil from my neighbor's farm and see what water does to the soil. So if the raindrops are beaten down and the water can't penetrate, it's gonna start running off. And, and as it runs off, it's gonna carry nutrients and fertilizer with it. Our heartland country out where they grow all the corn, they have about 2% cover crop and that's why 
all that heartland country drains into the Mississippi and we got this dead zone in the Gulf that's as big as the state of New Jersey. Uh, it's runoff. For here in Lancaster County, the Chesapeake Bay awareness has been out there for 30 or more years. And so because of all the education about the bay, some of the organizations have done like Stroud Water Research and uh, Chesapeake Bay Foundation, a lot of those organizations have helped bring awareness. Because of that, I think is why we're ahead of, of a lot of other areas of adoption. But there's also another thing I think this area here is unique for, is we have a higher percentage of owned land. It's hard to make the investment of cover crops and no-till because you don't always see instant returns mm -hmm. from it. Right. So if you have land you own, you're willing to invest in the soil a little bit more. Steve, has this field always looked like this in terms of good cover? Oh, no. Uh, 1980s, late 70s, 80s, there were times when right through here, we would have to close the ditches in order to harvest corn. There was ditches this deep. From soil erosion? Yes. And this is the field where I started no-tilling in 1982. This organic matter is tripled, and you can't find the ditch here. And then, by the way, there's no terraces here either uh, on, this, on this drive. So done fairly well. And it's been uh, very aggressively cover cropped and no-tilled, of course. And this is the result. And not only did I not lose soil, I did not contribute to any problems downstream. Trees are really important to the insects in the stream because they provide the shade to cool the water off. They have the nutrients from the leaves coming in, which is a food source for the bugs. Um, and they also prevent like runoff going directly into the stream. There's a stonefly, mayfly. If you see these sensitive indicators there, that's a sign that water quality is good. This is Trout Run. It's located on a nature preserve. It's in, uh, owned by Lancaster Conservancy. It's open to the public. And it's one of the nicer streams in Lancaster. It's got an amazing amount of nice bugs, the sensitive bugs that I was talking about. It's kind of a rare jewel, I would say, in this area right here. There's agriculture in this area, but this stream's just sort of buffered from it. Insects sort of are one of the bottom level of the food chain out here. A lot of them um, eat algae and microbes, and then they become a source of food for the fish and the birds and the turtles and salamanders and anything else that lives in the stream. The stream traditionally hasn't been something that us farmers have been real concerned about. Because it was like, our attention is on the fields, and once it leaves the fields, it's somebody else's problem. So to say I've noticed a lot of difference, I didn't used to pay a lot of attention. <laughs> now we're paying more attention because we realize that the streams carry what we don't keep. So it's important to keep an eye on that. So we're standing in a field that was corn this past year. And this field does not have a history of cover crops. And it also has been tilled. One of the things that is typical in a field that has not had many cover crops is the soil is more platy, comes, across, comes apart like that. Um, and it's uh, just the structure of it's a little bit more compacted and we don't have any living roots in there to fully support and enhance the living organisms that are in the soil. And when you walk over to a field that has had cover crops in it and not been tilled for over 25 years, it's softer. You can literally feel the difference when you walk on it. So we're gonna dig in here and just take a look at what this soil looks like that has a cover crop planted. Now first you can see we have living roots. You see the white roots, you see the nice 
crumbly structure. Look at that. And we have these beautiful white living roots here. They're providing uh, food for the microorganisms that a lot of them that we can't even see. But that structure there, that nice structure has not been formed by tillage. That's been formed basically by plants and just leaving the soil alone. So when I first started uh, no-till, I was just concerned about soil erosion. That's it, nothing more. I didn't know what about soil health, you know, any of those things we talk about these days. Now, as I'm understanding that actually when we get into the system, I can have higher water infiltration, which is good because when we get a heavy thunderstorm, I get that water, it ain't gonna run off. So it's not just about building the armor, so to speak, to protect the soil. It's about actually being able to infiltrate the, the water can infiltrate and then even be well drained as well. So both of those things seem a little counterintuitive, but they both work positive in this system. You need to have something living in your soil, preferably year round. And then diversity of species is another component that we've realized in the last 10 or 15 years that also will take the whole soil health concept up to a new level. So once you learn how to do this, you're basically letting nature work for you. Well, this is special to no-till planting. Okay. That's our no-till corn planter. We have the, um, the trash movers in the front here. They will part the trash and make a way for our, our disc openers. All planters have these disc openers on. And then the It'll open up a slot. The seed firmer will push the, the, uh, the seed to the bottom of the slot, and then these wheels come along and close it up. We have nitrogen in the, in the two center tanks, so we will be actually banding nitrogen as we uh, apply the, the seed. Uh, we have some pop-up on the outside tanks, so we do it all in one shot. It wasn't until about 1969 that we started with some no-till equipment and it happened to be orange and everybody knew that it wouldn't work because it was orange. It needed to be red and green, but eventually it caught on and, and of course around here, almost everybody no-tills. It's, it's an, ec an, an economic move. It takes about a third of the fuel to no-till an acre that it does conventional. Farming is a uh, a business where the profit margins are relatively small, plus the variability of the weather is kind of a wild card that every farmer goes into the spring knowing or hoping for a good year. And usually when they say they want a good year, that's that they're talking about the weather. Yeah. So tweaking anything sometimes can be um, either intimidating or risky. Okay, well here we are on May 1st. We're getting ready to uh plant this year's uh, corn crop. We're running about 10 days to two weeks uh, later than normal because of the cool weather that we've had. And uh, as you can see, the cover crop has grown nicely over the winter. This is about the stage I like the cover crop at because I do not have rollers on my uh, planter. And right here's a couple of nice vetch plants. This is obviously the canola here that's coming out in seed already uh, because of the, uh, the lateness of the, that we're getting started here. And there's also, and then this would be the wheat because this is a little smaller. The wheat and barley look similar. They're very hard to tell apart. This is strictly for cover. We are not harvesting it. If we were going to harvest this crop, it would have been planted um, two or three times thicker than what it is. We purposely want it thin like this because it's so easy to get the planter through. Plus the, there's some sunlight reaching the, the soil uh, to be able to warm the soil up. You can just visualize if we had a heavy thunderstorm now, how all this cover would hold everything in place. I mean, it, the, cover, the cover is just an anchor for, for everything here. It's, that's why we like this system so much. I think we built a lot of drought tolerance into our soil. There's no reason that we in the east here with 35 inches of rain 
should suffer a drought when we got people in the Midwest, the, in the Dakotas with 12 and 16 inches of rain are growing crops now that they brought the prairie back. That's fascinating to me. And right here we have bare soil coming along. Here you can see the, the seed firmer pushing the seed down and then, then these wheels come along and close, close it up. One of the biggest areas that people make mistakes on are with the planters. If the planters aren't set up right, if you don't get that seed in the ground properly, it's not gonna give you a good crop. And the other thing is sometimes you just have to give it a, a year or two. No-tilling the first year isn't really no-tilling. It's an attempt at no-tilling. No-tilling is a system. You know, and with the cover crops and and it's a system, it's not just a one-time event. You look at this, the, we, we had 210 bushel corn here, and if you look at, you can't hardly even see the soil. So at first glance, it's like, well, does this field even need a cover crop because there's, it's already covered? That was my thinking way back. But since we've been doing this, the biology has improved on the, the soil health has improved since adding the cover, and the main, reason that I really like it is because of capturing the nutrients from the manure. Each little plant, to me, is, is just like an injector. My way of in, injecting the manure is to apply it on this growing cover crop. The benefits that animals bring to the farm can further enhance the whole concepts that we talk about, reduced pesticides and reduced fertilizers. One of the things that are effective, that actually make cover crops more effective, is when you have an animal come in and ideally just eat the top third, that will stimulate the cover crop roots to grow more and actually more regrowth. So you actually get a net gain in both biomass production and root growth and root exudates and all that kind of good stuff. So animals help stimulate the biological factory even further. It just from a sheer profitability standpoint, uh, being diversified in another sector, you know, right. meat sector, it's a good thing. So this field here was uh, double crop soybeans that were uh, harvested in the middle of November. Now we did go in and plant a cover crop of triticale, a little hard to see it right now yet, but it's coming. And there's some of my uh, late planted hairy vetch here, which it's here as well. You can see it if you look close. And what is this? Uh, some of that is the soybean uh, stubble from last year and maybe a little bit of wheat stubble left from where this was wheat, the, the preceding crop. Uh, but this is actually gonna be planted into pumpkins. This will grow up, it'll grow up about four feet tall and we'll roll it down and we'll plant pumpkins in here. We'll, we'll plant no-till pumpkins in here in the, in the middle of June. We'll be going right through the living cover crop, so it'll be, it'll be green. Once the corn is planted and the corn is, is coming up, you can see, see it down the row. We'll come in at some point with Roundup or, or some type of glyphosate and we'll, we will kill the, the cover crop. And then once, once that starts to die, and the, the corn is coming up, I mean, it'll continually be green. So there's always something living growing there. About 30, 40 years ago, the advent of herbicides and so forth helped terminate the existing vegetation or the weeds that were growing there. Uh, but now we're starting to rely a little less on those herbicides, a little bit more on cover crops for weed control. And through some um, fairly modern I guess you'd say techniques of rolling down cover crops and crimping cover crops, we can even reduce our, our herbicides even further. A farmer who wants to start no-till today or year one with the knowledge we collectively know today, I could say that he could use less herbicides right out the gate if he gets the current understanding from right. people who are doing it. Uh, but it's still going to take some time to see how his fields react and so forth, because every field is literally different. And last year, it was wet in the spring, 
and we had a couple fields that got killed before it was planted. So then when the corn came up, the only thing growing or living in the field at the time was the corn. So when the slugs moved in, because of the cooler temperatures, the slugs started eating the corn. But the field right next to it, the slugs didn't bother the corn because the cover crop was still green. For the past, last spring and, and this spring, we didn't use any insecticide on the planter because what the recent, most recent research shows is that some of the insecticide that we had been using are actually killing the beneficial insects. If we don't use some of the insecticide, it keeps all the bugs there and then the, some of the good insects can eat the bad insects and we don't have to spend the extra money for that and we're not hurting anything else more than we need to. We just harvested our main crop from this field, which was 110 day uh, corn. It dried down to uh, about 23% moisture. And so we harvested it. And now we're getting uh, ready to put the next crop in, which is our cover crop. And this crop will be established right now and emerge in about uh, 10 days and then the, the roots and the, and the growth from it will capture the nutrients that are left over from the corn crop and also capture the nutrients that we're going to place down when we apply the manure. So this will grow this fall, be fairly dormant over winter, and then next spring we will come in and plant another corn crop back into this. So over the years in getting into this system, I have been able to reduce my off-farm input needs for fertility. And part of that happens just because I'm keeping it here. It's not leaving. Uh, part of it happens because I'm using cover crops that are legumes that create nitrogen. Nitrogen is the biggest uh, input that I need to buy uh, to grow mm -hmm. my crops. You, then you have the dynamic of increased organic matter. Uh, the organic matter is almost tripled in my farm. That is basically, I built my reservoir bigger. I can hold more nutrients. And that takes time to be able to get to that point. So, so I'm reaping the benefits of things I've done over the last 30 years now. And that'll only continue to get better and improve. Today, you need to know the numbers and use your numbers and be more efficient and make your investments work for you. Uh, you don't want to have too many bad ideas because they'll get you in trouble. The Takwan stream flows right through my farm and it's noted to be one of the cleanest streams in Lancaster County. It may not be uh, hard to understand that because a lot of it flows through woods and, and there's not as much farmland in it, which tells us something. That farmland is creating some of the pollution to streams around the area. So I'm kind of proud of the fact that that stream's flowing through my property. It's just something that I want to keep it as clean as I can. And I don't want to be putting things into that stream that's going to harm the, the life in that stream. And then more, more so downstream, when you get into the Chesapeake Bay, you're talking about people's livelihoods that it affects. And I've talked to the, the fishermen uh, there. And, and so having that connection was really important to be able to understand that what I do in my fields can affect their livelihood. It's one of the best ways to be a good steward of, of what God has given us. You know, the soil, the soil and, and, uh, and land is, it's the only, the only earth that we're ever gonna get. So we have to protect what we have. And in order to protect that, we have the different mixes of cover crops we can put in there to help build the soil. And if there's something growing there, it'll help filter the water, preserving the bay or just cleaning, keeping water clean in general. I'm not quite ready to quit yet either. Someone said to me, why don't you sell your farms and go do what you want to do? And I said, I'm doing what I want to do. Why would I want to go elsewhere?